Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nathan Gillespie, and I'm a Cook Leadership Academy fellow. I'm currently in my final year at Grand Valley, and I'm majoring in both finance and business economics, and have a strong interest in politics. Since childhood, I have always been a leader. Throughout my leadership development journey, I have consistently sought to cultivate a spirit of humble confidence, a tireless work ethic, and an inclusive personality. In that fashion, I constantly seek out diverse and challenging experiences to push me towards the pinnacle of my potential. A deep curiosity and a relentless drive for self-improvement drew me to the CLA. I've been a fellow for only two months, yet already the Academy has afforded me endless opportunities to enhance my leadership acumen. From the chance to learn from incredibly successful West Michigan leaders such as yourselves and national leaders, to thought-provoking case studies and self-reflections, to a close proximity to peers with impeccable characters worth emulating. The Cook Leadership Academy never ceases to push me towards absolute excellence. In the spirit of Ralph Allenstein, Arthur Vandenberg, and Gerald R. Ford, I look forward to leveraging these invaluable learning experiences in my efforts to become an innovative leader in the international business community and a future elected servant of the people. My name is Nathan Gillespie, and I'm a leader. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, patient friends and family. Uh, it is so appropriate that tonight we have, uh, this is a shared affair, this event between the Hauerstein Center and the Gerald R. Ford Museum and Presidential Foundation. Uh, before World War II, Ralph Hauenstein was city editor of the Grand Rapids Herald, where Arthur Vandenberg had been the editor, longtime editor, for about 20 years. Ralph recalled the Reverend Thomas Senator's visits back from Washington, where he put his feet up on one of the desks in the newsroom and proceeded to hold forth for the newsroom staff. And then, uh, as for President Ford, the senator was becoming a world figure in 1946 when he met a young lawyer who had just come out of the Navy. And they were at the Pentland Hotel in Vandenberg's office, and Vandenberg had come from one of the peace conferences he was attending in Paris. Gerald Ford was hanging out his shingle as an attorney, and he was also the fresh face of the home front movement, the effort to challenge the corrupt Republican machine of Frank McKay. Two years later, Vandenberg was fuming over the refusal of his own hometown congressman to support his efforts to win approval of the Marshall Plan and other post-war legislation. And he, he was eager to see that congressman bring up and challenge. Yonkman was also a McKay man. Van let it be known that he was backing the young lawyer for Congress. But this Cliff Notes version of our story starts at the beginning of the last century, about five blocks across the river where a teenager just out of Central High School fell under the sway of the most exciting politician of 100 years ago, Theodore Roosevelt. Young Arthur was something of a prodigy in government studies. He'd been reading the Congressional since he was 14. I don't have anything to verify that. I can take his word for it. But he lost his job at a biscuit factory to join the parade when Teddy came to town in the fall of 1900, running for vice president with William McKinley. He was fired, but the teenage Vandenberg managed to get a job as a reporter at the Grand Rapids Herald. His first byline, who was still a teenager, was a big story on the Electoral College, so you could tell what was going on in his mind. He was a regular Republican when the city and the state and the country pretty generally were all mostly Republican. And he was impossibly young, just at the age of 22, when he became editor of the Republican paper owned by Senator William Alden Smith. He was making a name for himself on the national stage before he went to the Senate in 1928, where he was appointed on the death of Woodbridge Ferris and then elected a few months later. He had already written three books about his hero, Alexander Hamilton, uh, none of which, of course, were options for a musical. <laughs> <laughs> for the presidential candidate Warren Harding, and he was sending his editorials off to the senators in Washington who were resisting American membership in the League of Nations. When he reached the Senate, he was eager to work with the new president, Herbert Hoover, 
But Hoover, who had never held elective office and was brilliant in so many ways, lacked finesse, to say the least, in working with Congress. And then the stock market crash in 1929 doomed his presidency. Vandenberg tries to work with Franklin Roosevelt as well after FDR's landslide victory in 1932. He's a savvy politician in a state that is yeah, beginning to turn purple. And he's also ready in a time of national emergency to cooperate with the Democratic administration. So he supports some of the early New Deal remedies for a crippled economy. <coughs> and he has one of his own. Bank savings de deposit insurance to protect small depositors and save the nation's banks. Hoover had fought him on this, didn't like the idea. And FDR didn't either. But Vandenberg lined up the votes in the Senate and a new law created the FDIC. Roosevelt came to see the value of it, and much to Vandenberg's chagrin, was all too happy to claim credit for what may have been the most successful piece of New Deal legislation. But it was the brainchild of Arthur Vandenberg. As the reach of federal power grew, however, Vandenberg tried to draw a good Republican distinction between being social-minded and socialistic. He broke the Roosevelt over executive rulemaking that he regarded as too intrusive. He was a vigilante when he thought the New Deal was overstepping the Constitution. Nor could he abide Roosevelt's efforts to pack the Supreme Court because it had rejected some of his laws. This hardening of his opposition to FDR was coinciding with world events that posed new dangers. This is the 1930s with the rise of Hitler in Germany and Mussolini in Italy and European peace appeared threatened. And then the Japanese war cabinet ordered an invasion of China. In the face of threats around the globe, Vandenberg fell back on what for him was a first principle, that Hamiltonian tradition, American neutrality. No entangling alliances. And this was in 1939 after Germany occupied Austria, annexed a part of Czechoslovakia and sent its bombers over Warsaw and its tanks rolling into Poland. This is not our war, Vandenberg declared over a national radio broadcast here in Ramona Park in East Grand Rapids on what was once a baseball diamond. It became our war with the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. He led a band of isolationists, mostly Republicans, but Democrats too, who fought Roosevelt every step of the way. They fought and lost to keep the arms embargo of the 1937 Neutrality Act to prevent FDR from aiding our future allies. They fought and lost the Lend-Lease deal, giving destroyers to the British Navy. Roosevelt was their nemesis. They didn't trust him. And Arthur Vandenberg was their organizing spirit. In 1936, he had avoided Kansas Governor Alf Landon's attempt to draft him as his running mate it was a smart move. Uh, <laughs> FDR carried every state except Maine and Vermont. In 1940, he was viewed as a dark as a dark horse candidate for the Republican presidential nomination. But he and his isolationist colleague in the Senate, Robert Taft, were swept aside along with their traditional isolationist view by a charismatic lawyer, Wendell Wilkie whose willingness to intervene in Europe nearly matched Roosevelt's. And this is Wilkie with Taft and Vandenberg in 1940. The, the attack on Pearl Harbor made Vandenberg's traditional view look obsolete, and America was soon all in, in a global war. As the war began to turn in favor of the Allies, who had been dubbed by Franklin Roosevelt the United Nations, Republicans faced two big questions. One question was partisan. Wilkie was what today might be called a rhino, a Republican in name only. He had no party base and was viewed by much of the GOP as an opportunistic interloper. Any comparisons to the present day will start to get a bit confusing. <laughs> but his nomination reflected a deep schism in the party, one that is still with us today. Between isolationists or unilateralists, and internationalists are those who believe in greater, a greater role for the United States around the world. If the Republicans were going to have a chance to win the presidency in 1944, these factions needed to come together. But how? The other question in the minds of Americans 
among Americans of all political stripes, what would the world look like after the war, and what role should the United States play in it? Would the U.S. retreat again, as it did after World War I? Then Vandenberg's editorials faulted Wilson and expressed reservations about the League of Nations covenant. Now the question was whether and how nations might organize themselves to avoid future catastrophes. And Roosevelt wasn't saying, and he wasn't letting Cong the Democrats in Congress tackle the subject either. All these senators and representatives were eager to introduce resolutions to talk about what would happen after the war. But Roosevelt, who was also kind of a one-man band on foreign policy, was focused on winning the war and didn't want a lot of conflicting or disrupting proposals out there. To answer the first question, the partisan one, about Republican unity, the party called a meeting of leading GOP officials to be held at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island over Labor Day weekend, 1943. Chosen to chair the GOP foreign policy group. Not for the first time, he looked for a middle way between those two divided elements of the party. In this case, between isolationists who not, wanted nothing more than to wash their hands of the world and bring the troops home after the war, and these were his longtime friends and allies, and the Wilkie adherents and others who held varying ideas about world federalism, an international police force, a revived League of Nations. And this is Vandenberg in, on the porch at the Grand Hotel, and here he is in the in the what was called the casino at the Grand with. Uh, Taft and Earl Warren to the right side of the screen. Republicans came out of that meeting at the Grand with a statement they could run on and an expression of support for some sort of world organization. When Roosevelt and the Democrats offered nothing at the same time because Roosevelt was trying to keep a lid on that debate. So the wonderfully ambiguous, grandly named Mackinac Charter set the stage for things to come. When I succeeded in putting 49 prima donnas together, Vandenberg told Henry Luce of Time Magazine after the conference, and it certainly took one to know one as when it came to prima donnas, <laughs> I discovered the necessary formula. For Vandenberg, compromise was almost an art form. He was moving away from isolationism. Pearl Harbor played a part. So did his nephew, Hoyt Vandenberg who lived with him here in Grand Rapids so that he could get an appointment to West Point through Senator William Alden Smith. Hoyt became an Air Force general, a student of modern warfare, and a major observer at the Battle of Britain who understood what future war strategy was likely to look like. Um, some people said that his mistress played a part, Mitzi Sims, who was probably planted on him by British intelligence in the late 1930s. I don't think Mitzi influenced him much, but the fawning press response to the Mackinac Charter certainly nudged him along to think, yes, I'm getting pretty good, pretty good press when I speak out in favor of a world organization. He was moving in a new direction, but still mostly behind the scenes. Most, most of the public still thought of him as a stalwart isolationist. But that changed on January 10th, 1945. The Allies were winning the war, closing in on Japan, island by bloody island, pushing across the Rhine into Germany, and a weary Roosevelt, in poorer health than anyone knew, was about to leave for the Russian resort of Yalta on the Black Sea to meet with Stalin and Churchill to talk about what to do as the collapse of the Third Reich drew near. Vandenberg was worried. Neither he nor his colleagues knew what the three leaders would be deciding nor did they trust Franklin Roosevelt or what he might agree to. Vandenberg rose in the Senate that January to announce a proposal, a post-war security treaty among the victorious allies to ensure that Germany would never again wage war on its neighbors. Boom. This was the leading isolationist calling for an American commitment to an entangling alliance with countries that had fought two world wars in the last three decades. It was, one correspondent said, the speech heard round the world. Now FDR spoke dismissively of it, but the White House made a hasty request for 50 copies of the speech before the president left for Yalta. 
Within months, the world and Vandenberg's place in it changed quickly. Roosevelt returned from Yalta knowing that he had no choice if he was to avoid Woodrow Wilson's fatal mistake with the League of Nations after World War I, other than to appoint Arthur Vandenberg, the Republican voice on foreign policy, as a delegate to the conference set to convene in May 1945 in San Francisco to create the United Nations. Then Franklin Roosevelt died. Vice President Harry Truman had had lunch one time with the president. He was a neophyte in foreign affairs, though a, though a decisive one. The UN meeting, he quickly decided, would go ahead just weeks after Roosevelt's death. Since Roosevelt had often worked around the State Department in crafting foreign policy, his young Secretary of State, Edward Statinius, charged with leading the American delegation, was also something of a marginal player. And Vandenberg's Democratic counterpart on the delegation, Foreign Relations Chairman Tom Connolly of Texas, was a canny old politician, but again of somewhat limited range. That left Vandenberg, the Republican who had come, round, come out to speak first in favor of an international organization to emerge as the most influential American delegate. And this is in the penthouse of the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco where the, the Americans, the Russians, the Chinese, the British, and the French gathered apart from the larger assembly of all nations. This, this was the, the nucleus of the Security Council. Uh, Vandenberg is there, uh, fourth from the right, uh, fourth from the left, and uh, far end at the right, to the right of Statinius in the chair at the end, you may recognize Andrei Gromyko, who was the Russian ambassador up until the 1960s to the US. The, Um, as they met there, Vandenberg was sitting down with the other powers to design what Vandenberg called the town meeting of the world. His opinion and that of the Soviet foreign secretary, Molotov, who's not in this picture, seemed to be the ones that counted most. And in their negotiations over the UN charter, Vandenberg allowed, made sure to allow for regional security arrangements so that the Monroe Doctrine could be updated and Latin American neighbors could have a mutual defense treaty with the United States. He also made sure there would be enough Republicans on board in the Senate to approve the charter when it landed in their laps. And here he's signing the UN Charter with President Truman to his far left there. And Truman needed him. After the charter was ratified, the president asked Vandenberg and Connolly to play an unprecedented role in international diplomacy, not only attending the first General Assembly of the UN in London later in the year, but also joining the new Secretary of State, James Burns, for peace conferences with foreign ministers in Paris through much of 1946, where they're deciding on all the individual peace treaties with countries that had fought with Germany, Italy and Romania and long, a long list of countries. And when they went to London for the first UN meeting, the delegation included Vandenberg, Connolly, Statinius, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt and Vandenberg had a very difficult history because Vandenberg was always lighting into her husband and she really resented that. And she was doing things that he didn't approve of. Pretty liberal, but among her, among her projects was a, um, a scheme. There were a number of, of planned communities that she had encouraged around the country, and one was called Arthurdale in West Virginia, and its cottage industry in this community was furniture. You can imagine how the senator from Grand Rapids viewed federal funds going into making furniture. So even at that level, the two never got along. But after they traveled and served together at the UN, Vandenberg said, um, I take back everything I ever said about her, and it's been plenty. And so you never know what happens with politics. <laughs> That was the year also that Look Magazine published a profile of Vandenberg. And in that story are a couple of paragraphs I can't resist sharing that get at some of the aspects of his influence. Every few months, wrote Look, several million people become grateful to Grand Vandenberg for expressing their vague thoughts, such as, what is Russia up to? <laughs> 
was a master politician in his ability to be flexible and principled at the same time. It might take a whirling dervish to follow the pros and cons of Vandenberg's Senate votes over the past 18 years, Look noted. But Vandenberg has whirled as the American people have whirled. Or as one of his fellow senators put it, Van changes his mind about as often as the average American, but slightly earlier. <laughs> and I think there's a sort of understated hint of genius there, slightly earlier. That means that you are not so far out in front that you're a leader without followers, and he was certainly no visionary, but also that you are not simply part of the, part of the pack. And it brings to mind also a, a quote from Emerson, who uh, Vandenberg certainly read, and he had an essay called Self-Reliance that resonated with the senator. And Emerson said, speak what you now think in hard words, and tomorrow, speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again though it contradict everything you've said today. <laughs> really, what he's saying is be ready to change and willing when the time is right. And that's what Vandenberg was doing and bringing millions of anxious Americans with him as they're trying to navigate a new world after the war. And that made a big difference when Truman asked for support of the Truman Doctrine, calling for the US to help nations threatened by totalitarian, read communist subversion, and more specifically, to pick up the baton for the British and aid the governments of Greece and Turkey against communist pressure. And here's Vandenberg, who was president pro tem of the Senate, so he's behind Truman in 1947 as, as Truman is laying out the Truman Doctrine. It made all the difference when Secretary of State George Marshall unveiled an unprecedented aid program to help the European democracies rebuild their shattered economies. Truman had the political sense to call this the Marshall Plan after the revered general. Marshall himself said it could have been called the Vandenberg Plan because he reflected when it went to Congress, Van was just the whole show. And here's Marshall testifying before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee with Vandenberg there on the left, and he's chairing it. But rebuilding economies was not enough. There was also the power vacuum left by the war and now being filled in Eastern Europe by the Soviet Red Army. The war-wracked Western democracies formed a European Union for mutual defense and invited the Americans to join. This was a big one, an entangling alliance which Vandenberg once had so adamantly resisted. He now had a Pan-American security treaty allowed under the UN Charter to use as a template and from that crafted the Vandenberg Resolution, which allowed American entry into the new North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It too sailed through Congress with Vandenberg's leadership. He was mentioned as a presidential candidate in 1948. He wasn't gonna work for it. He wrote an acceptance speech because his ego said, well, maybe they'll draft me, which usually doesn't happen. But this is written now square in Philadelphia, and you can see all the, the newsmen and cameras crowding around him. But those bipartisan majorities in Congress were his pride and joy. They began to fray about the time he was diagnosed in 1949 with lung cancer. After fighting fellow Republicans in the House to secure funding for NATO military aid, he was flown to Ann Arbor in September of 1949 for an operation that removed half of his left lung. As Mao and the communists emerged victorious in the Chinese Civil War, Vandenberg was headed back to Morris Avenue here in Grand Rapids to the house he had built as a young editor in 1907. He returned to Washington just briefly in 1950, but he was really too ill to be active. He paid one last visit to the Senate floor. Not only had bipartisanship suffered amid recrimination over who lost China, but a young Republican senator from Wisconsin named McCarthy was fomenting fear with wild accusations of con communists in the Democratic administration. And war had broken out in Korea. The bipartisan bonds were fraying and Vandenberg was not there to patch them up. As Edward R. Murrow told his radio audience the week of Vandenberg's death in Grand Rapids in 1951, we are now divided bitterly, hysterically. Had he lived, he would have gloried in this conflict and steadied it. 
And he would have been confident that at the end of the day, little men of loud voice and small faith will yield to the collective judgment of the American people. Thank you very much. Well, that was just Hi, a Thank you. <laughs> great overview of Arthur Vandenberg. And I think there are a lot of questions that I've heard people ask you over the years. And I guess, first of all, I'd like to say um, that, or ask you, Hank, what was the thing that made you write about Arthur Vandenberg in the first place? What was it about his character, his leadership, his historic importance? Well, I'd, I'd step back and say, I think he was the most important political figure of the 20th century for whom there was no biography. So that's kind of a, a startling claim, but I think it's true, and he's from Grand Rapids, and that combination became irresistible. And what about you in the role of writer? You're a busy guy. You do a lot of different things, and yet you set your, your sights on writing this biography. I believe it was 26, 27 years ago. <laughs> <clears throat> As a matter of fact, Ralph Hallenstein used to say that he was 10 years old when Hank started his biography. <laughs> well, and there are friends and family members here who, who, for whom the conversational opener was often, how's the book coming? <laughs> and, and I never knew whether that was out of friendly concern or like, we're really tired of you talking about this and it's about time it came out. So. <laughs> but you spent a lot of time with this man in the archives and interviewing people. And what was it that you were able to do as a writer? I mean, you, you're a busy guy. You spent a lot of time crafting this book. Tell us a little bit about how you actually wrote it when you have so many other responsibilities in your life. Well, I mean, the joke is that it took 26 years. So <laughs> the, that, and, and I had enough flexibility in my job at intervals during that time that I could take a day a week in the early 90s <laughs> and go down to the Bentley Library in Ann Arbor where uh, Vandenberg's papers are, or um, fly out to Connecticut to um, his youngest daughter, Betsy, was in her 80s then, and we became quite close. So I, I, would, I had that freedom, and then the, you, you, as a biographer, you're never done with the research. I mean, people are asking you good questions even today that I wish I had the answers to that, oh, I didn't get to that or I didn't think about that. But you have to start writing long before, the, since the research is never done, you have to start writing as you're doing the research. And so that was, that was going along and becoming an enormous manuscript that, um, that I knew needed to be shortened. I mean, you're operating, I was operating with conflicting ideas. One, because the subject it wasn't commercial, but it would find a home somewhere because it was a story that had to be told. But I also knew that having a thousand page manuscript, just because I'd done all this research and had all this background on his life in Grand Rapids, I didn't have a publishable product. It had to, it had to be cut significantly. You interviewed a lot of people. How many people did you interview in all for this book? Well, certainly dozens. Dozens. I, I haven't, I haven't tallied that up. Many dozens, I would imagine. Interesting people. Who was the most interesting person that you interviewed and why? What insights did they give you? Well, the most interesting person gave me very few insights. I mean, certainly, it would be Gore Vidal. Um, <laughs> Gore Vidal's grandfather was a blind senator from Oklahoma, and he was, uh, he was out of the Senate when Vandenberg was there, but still living in Washington, and he was kind of a, kind of a crusty conservative. And, and Vandenberg became friends with him. And so when, um, and Vandenberg's wife Hazel, who had been in the newspaper business also and was a, was a very good writer, uh, kept pretty extensive diaries and she had a page on the visit that the Vandenbergs made to Senator Gore's estate off Rock Creek Park in Washington in the mid 19, late 1930s. And he, this senator was blind, and his grandson, who was in the wake of his mother's divorce, was living with his grandparents, uh, would often take his 
grandfather to political events, to conventions and all kinds of things. And so Gore actually met Vandenberg when he was about 14 years old. And, uh, and Hazel Vandenberg wrote this wonderful summary of the day they visited. And I sent it to Gore Vidal right at the time that Gore Vidal's biographer was beginning work on his life. And Gore didn't have much about his early years in Washington. And this was a description about the house where he was living. And so he was sufficiently willing on that basis to take a little time to talk to me. And uh, at that time, he was working on his most recent uh, historical novel. He's got a series, in, in, and this one was set in Washington and called The Golden Age, set in the 1940s, where Vandenberg figures as a character. Now, I don't know how much influence I had on that, but um, he, he was clearly interested in why I would be interested. And so um, I didn't get much from him, but it was really fun trying to make the case for doing Vandenberg with him. Well, you also, you just exhaustively went through archives, both at the Bentley at the University of Michigan, but also at different presidential libraries. What was the most interesting document? What, what did it reveal to you? That um, well, what was really fun was, um, and again, the most interesting may not be the most influential in a scholarly context, but uh, there were all, the, all these rumors about Vandenberg having an affair with this woman, Mitzi Sims, whose husband was a Canadian attache at the British Embassy um, of indeterminate job, but the rumors were that he worked in the code room where he was, and was also a good friend of William Stevenson who ran the British intelligence operation in the US. And the, Mitzi Sims and her husband lived one floor up in the Wardman Park Hotel apartments in Washington from the Vandenbergs and they socialized a lot together. And it was hard to pin down whether they actually had an affair or not. And Betsy Sands, Vandenberg's granddaughter, kept kind of denying it. She didn't want to get into it. And then finally, as we became closer, she, the, the family and, and her um, uh, nephew Jib is here tonight, the family uh, had donated their papers, Vandenberg's papers to the Bentley Library, including uh, Hazel Vandenberg's scrapbooks. And, the you know wonderful material to go through with clippings and pictures, but Betsy brought out the one page in the scrapbooks that they had not donated. That had a picture of Mitzi Sims. It had a picture of Hazel out in Arizona where she'd gone for sinus troubles. She had bad allergies. With uh, happened to be with with elderly General Pershing, and she writes in it next to that picture, much happier then than I am now and writes next to uh, Mitzi's picture, uh, kind of like, aha. And, uh, and, and Betsy said, yes, it had reached a point in the household where Arthur had to decide whether he was going to stay or whether he would go. And um, very traumatic times for the couple. And they ended up patching things back together. But those, that was just, she gave me the one piece, one document that they had withheld when the family donated the papers. Well, since we're the Hallenstein Center, one of the people that you interviewed was Ralph, Ralph W. Hallenstein. And uh, could you reveal to us what Ralph said to you? Well, what, what was fun, Ralph became, in, in 1938, I think it was, when Vandenberg was predicted by, again, before isolationism was discredited by um, the onset of World War Two and Wilkie swept to the nomination, Vandenberg was regarded as maybe the leading Republican candidate for the Republican presidential nomination in 1940. And so I think it was 1938, Ralph shared that the, uh, an FBI agent came into the Grand Rapids Herald offices and announced he was setting up an office in Grand Rapids and was interested in looking through the Herald's morgue. And Ralph, being a good newspaper man, said, no, you can't just you know, rifle through our morgue. What are you here for? <laughs> and the FBI agent, who became a friend of his, said, um, I'm here to get information on Arthur Vandenberg. So if you think about it, why would Roosevelt 
set, create in 1938 an FBI office in Grand Rapids. I mean, there wasn't enough going on in Grand Rapids really to justify that. <laughs> and so Ralph was completely convinced that this guy was straightforward and that's how, um, that's why the FBI was here. Well, it's fascinating. In fact, Ralph told me along these lines as well that uh, they did become very good friends, that both couples did. So mm -hmm. Ralph and Grace would go out dancing with yep. the uh, FBI guy and mm -hmm. his wife. And <laughs> so really, Ralph ended up playing the FBI and not the other way around. <laughs> very good. Well, let's, uh, let's turn this now to Vandenberg's life per se, Grand Rapids. You know, we have a Leadership Academy, Cook Leadership Academy. You saw Nate earlier. Uh, who were Vandenberg's mentors when he was growing up in an informative stage? Uh, well, he was a hero worshiper, so he had a lot of them. In a, in a larger sense, Alexander Hamilton, right? He just, I think um, Vandenberg's father had been a harness maker and they'd enjoyed a pretty comfortable middle class life, but his harness business collapsed uh, in, when Vandenberg was nine years old and he went to work to support the family. And so even though he wasn't in the orphan situation that Hamilton was, he really identified with the young go-getter coming in from the hinterlands, I mean, in his case, Grand Rapids versus Nevis, but um, trying to make his way from a very early age. And so he idolized Alexander Hamilton. Closer to home, the uh, William Alden Smith was the publisher of the Grand Rapids Herald, and he was a congressman then becoming a senator. And he was the one who promoted Vandenberg into the, to be editor. And Vandenberg really looked up to him. I mean, here you had up close in the, in the office um, somebody who was pretty highly regarded senator. I mean, he had been talked about as a running mate for, for Teddy Roosevelt uh, in, what, 1904. And uh, so those, those were big figures in his life. Then when he went to Washington, his his idol and mentor was a guy named William Bora, the Lion of Idaho, a senator, Republican senator, who was a progressive in many ways, but was an ardent isolationist. And so Vandenberg really picked up the isolationist baton as, as leading spokesman in the party from William Bora. Okay. And then Hamilton himself, what an interesting, what a fascinating figure when you project out another couple, three decades. I think uh, Vandenberg wrote his three books basically in the early 20s yes. on, mm -hmm. on Hamilton. Hamilton was an institution builder. If you look at his role at the Constitutional Convention and then in New York, Hamilton really built a lot of this country at the foundation. And of course, Vandenberg would end up being an institution builder several decades after he was writing about Hamilton. Yeah. That no doubt inspired him to take such a bold role. No question. And, and like Hamilton, he was... Um, very much a, a Republican with a little R in the sense of, of very suspicious of populism. And so it very, very much concerned with the kinds of checks and balances that the Federalist Papers are so pivotal on. Right. Well, so he goes to Washington and how quickly does he learn the job? You know, people bandy about this idea of term limits and we've certainly seen what term limits have done in Lansing. At the federal level, every once in a while, they're banning about. How quickly did Vandenberg master what had to be mastered in the Senate to do his job and emerge as a leader? Well, he felt a real sense of urgency because he had to run for election only about six months after he was appointed. So he, did, he figured he had to go out and make a name for himself because at that time there was still this sort of idea that, that senators had to wait their turn and the seniority system was so important that you didn't go out and make a lot of noise. And he felt like he had to make a lot of noise early. And so, um, you know, whether it was Selfridge Air Base in Detroit or, or uh, trying to preserve Fort Wayne or um, whatever it might be, he was very active very early. And then he always was trying to see, he really wanted to, ally himself with President Hoover. And so really worked hard because Hoover, one of Hoover's struggles was, I mean, the Republican Party, there's always this schism, right? I mean, there were the, there were the progressives like Bora and prim, often from the West who were actually quite liberal. I mean, this was a very big tent party. And then there were the, the old guard who really did, who resisted change and who viewed Hoover as too liberal. And he's always, Vandenberg's always trying to bring those two groups together. And, and in the process, I think, 
created a name for himself as a guy who really um, people could go to to make things happen. Did he write his own speeches? Oh, yes. <laughs> Tell us about his well, he, passion he, for... He, he, he was a two-finger typist, but uh, he would write his own speeches, and then because he was also had such great relationships with a lot of the reporters in town, he would, he would share a big speech with half a dozen different reporters and let them chime in. So the big speech on January 10th, uh, James Reston may actually be credited with the idea, who's the New York Times bureau chief then, um, credited with the idea of suggesting this post-war security treaty to, to keep Germany from uh, ever threatening anybody. What was the toughest speech he ever delivered? toughest speech he ever delivered, I think would be, uh, what is Russia up to now? Um, and uh, this, no, this that was, was yesterday? Yeah. <laughs> where he's, where, where, again, he's, he's afraid that, um, that they have got a better strategy, which they probably didn't have than we did, and we had to figure out what was going on. But in that speech, he used, well, he, so that speech he called his Iron Curtain speech. And he actually had, this was a time when, when senators would give a speech and they'd send out, send out copies of it to everybody and have stationery printed up, especially for that speech. And it says um, uh, Iron Curtain speech right on the envelope. This was in the fall of 1945, several months before Churchill in Fulton, Missouri, used the phrase Iron Curtain. Now Churchill had used it before, but it wasn't out there in the public. And so Vandenberg gives this speech and the, uh, it, it, it doesn't get much response. And it happens on the same day that Eisenhower returns the victorious general from World War II after the war is over now in the fall of 45 returns to the United States to a hero's welcome, and that dominates the news. And John Foster Dulles, who was an advisor and friend of Vandenberg's and later Secretary of State for Eisenhower, sends this note to Vandenberg and says, great speech, basically too, nobody, too bad nobody paid attention, but, but the coinage will catch on. <laughs> and, but it didn't until Churchill gave his speech several months later. We're starting to get questions in from the audience, and so uh, while I organize these questions from you, let me ask you this. We have a number of students in the audience, members of the Cook Leadership Academy. What should they be looking at in Vandenberg's leadership, his, you know, how effective he was, how ethical he was? What can they learn from Vandenberg's leadership and start to apply right now? I think a willingness to change in a principled way. You bring your preconceptions to, in, in, in Vandenberg's case, to, to political ideas but then you recognize that either they alone aren't the answer or circumstances change and you need new answers. And the ability to make those adjustments, to constantly be open to new ideas, I think is what's so important. In a previous conversation, you and I have talked about conversion, the idea of conversion, and you told me that there's a biblical figure that happened to be Vandenberg's favorite. We're in West Michigan, let's yeah. go ahead and you know, well, well Vandenberg wrote, I mean, he wrote these three books on Hamilton, but, but the guy loved to write. I mean, his prose was pretty purple, and his wife helped him tone it down and clean it up, <laughs> which I can really relate to. But, the, <laughs> um, but he always wanted to write a biography of St. Paul because he loved that conversion story. And, of course, he would, might inflate his own ego and say, I had a conversion story, too. Now, his wasn't quite as dramatic as the road to Damascus, but, uh, <laughs> but he, he, that was very much in his mind. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, here's a question from the audience that I think situates Vandenberg here in the Midwest very nicely. So did the Midwest, or to what extent did the Midwest, as an American region, influence Vandenberg's thinking in his statecraft? I think it started out making him an isolationist because this was an area particularly, uh, George Smith here who's done a biography of Colonel McCormick, I mean this was the world of the Chicago Tribune which was the, the heart of isolationism and Vandenberg was very much had that feeling. I mean we, he, he, one of his um, early editorials he, he said, you know, we're not of the coasts where people go down to the sea in ships. We're, we're, I mean, we're really aloof from a lot of what's happening in Europe or where there are wars. 
Um, so that influenced him. Um, but I think in his later years, I'm, 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 I mean, we can all say there are certain Midwestern virtues that we hope ground us in our sense of place. I don't want to make too big a deal out of that. But when, if you think about it, all the most important figures politically in that post-war period, almost all of them were Midwesterners. Even you had Truman, Eisenhower, Taft, um, I'm gonna, I don't want to go down too long a laundry list, but the key figures in both parties were Midwesterners to a large extent in that, in that immediate post-war period. And of course that was a time when the Midwest as an industrial belt. And, I tell, and, I, of, and Thomas Dewey, who happened to be, he might have been a governor yes. of New York, but he was from Owasso. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Another question from the audience. Describe the friendship between Senator Vandenberg and the chaplain of the U.S. Senate, Peter Marshall. Um, there, was a, a, and there was both a book and a movie written, uh, the book by Marshall's wife called A Man Called Peter. And he was a Presbyterian minister, a Scotsman, and Vandenberg, as president pro tem of the Senate, one of his tasks each day would be the chaplain would come to him in the, um, in the president pro tem's office off the Senate floor, and they would talk about what that day's prayer would be. And they became pretty close friends. I mean, I think there was almost a paternal feeling of Vandenberg for um, this this charismatic young minister who actually died quite young of a heart attack. Uh, but he, Vandenberg would talk about, you know, today we're going to, to debate NATO, or today we're going to talk about this or that. And then um, Marshall would, would craft his brief sermon based on that conversation. Oh, how interesting. Now, if Arthur Vandenberg came back to life for one hour tonight, what question or questions would you ask him? Whoa. What do you want to know? <laughs> it's not in the book. Uh, I, would, I, I would have to ask him what of all those things I listed was most influential for him in changing his ideas about America's role in the world. You know, how, how big a part did your nephew play? I'm really curious about that because, so, so Vandenberg is senator, prominent Republican senator, and you've got Democratic presidents, and your, your nephew, Hoyt, is the, is, who becomes Air Force Chief of Staff, he becomes the second director of the CIA. Uh, they don't want their family activities to be very public. I mean, Hoyt's trying to advance in a Democratic administration, and, and Vandenberg is a Republican rival, and so um, they, would, they would meet in the kitchen of Vandenberg's apartment at the Wardman Park on you know, sort of Sunday afternoon social visits, and I'd love to hear that conversation. Yeah, that'd be, what is your suspicion about that? I mean, how would you answer that? I, mean, I think Hoyt kept saying, Uncle Arthur, you got to realize that you know, there are bombers that can deliver nuclear weapons here, and we need to get along. Why do you think it took so long for someone to write a scholarly biography of this fascinating man? Well, uh, there was the because the first two the first two would be biographers died before it was written. <laughs> there was there was a no there was a Grand Rapids press reporter named Ralph Smith who was a contemporary of Vandenberg's who who kept his own very meticulous scrapbooks that are at the Bentley Library in Ann Arbor. And he had planned to write it and didn't, did not live to do so. I don't know if he made any progress with it. And then the, I don't want to get too long-winded, but this is actually the story of how I got involved in this whole project. The, there was a, a, a historian who did his PhD at the University of Michigan and in 1970 published a, the Making of a Modern Republican, a biography of Vandenberg that took him up to 1945. Well, 1945 is when everything really starts to happen, but it, was, so it, but it was his PhD dissertation, and he turned that into a book published by Michigan State University Press, and that was, and presumably he was working on a second volume. And in fact, <clears throat> to digress from that, and Gordon Olson is here tonight, uh, who, was our, who was our city historian uh, when I was working on this book, and Gordon and I had known each other 
prior to this, and, and I had done some research on actually my grandfather at the Grand Rapids Library, and Gordon and I had been talking about the, you know, I said, I, I keep running across Arthur Vandenberg, and in my own reading, because I've always loved uh, international relations, I keep reading about Vandenberg, but he was always tangential to somebody else's story. And I said, I'd like to really, you know, it'd be fun to write a biography of him, but this other guy has already written one volume, presumably is working on another, and the world does not need another book on Arthur Vandenberg. And so Gordon said, well, you know, I, I would say Gordon had to fill out, he was in charge of the program for the Historical Society of Michigan's annual meeting in annual conference in October of 1989. And Gordon says to me, well, don't, you know, you don't have to write the biography, but why don't you just take some little aspect of, of Vandenberg's career and, and talk about that on my program for the Historical Society of Michigan, because they have you know, a very full schedule of a couple of dozen different sort of breakout topic kind of things. And so I said, okay, so I did the debate in 1939 over the repeal of the arms embargo. Um, I think there were six people in the audience in Lansing at that conference. <laughs> uh, and one of them, to his credit, was Mayor Logie. And Bill Bile is here tonight, and he, no, Bill was at a, at a later one, but, um, but John Logie was there. But, um, so I gave a little talk on, on this aspect of Vandenberg's career. And in January of 1990, about eight weeks later, I get a call from the daughter of this biographer, David Tompkins, who was teaching in Chicago and lived in Wilmette. And he had died, and his adult daughter was cleaning up his estate, wanting to sell his house, and didn't know what to do with all of his research on Arthur Vandenberg for his second volume. And it was boxes of files from the Truman Library, the Roosevelt Library, the British Foreign Office, you name it. And it had no monetary value, but she hated to just throw it on the street. So she calls the Historical Society of Michigan, says, do you know anybody who has an interest in Arthur Vandenberg? <laughs> well, I had, you know, eight weeks before, I'd spoken at their conference, and so they gave her my phone number, and I ended up bringing a van load of papers back from the would-be second biographer, <laughs> and all of a sudden you go from saying, well, the world doesn't need another one, to saying, well, if you don't do it, who does? And that was how it got started. Okay. You're making me nervous for you. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay. So Vandenberg comes from a different era, and when things really start to open up for him, and he's able to make his greatest impact, some historians call this period after World War II the age of consensus, or it's from the, well, mid-World War II on. And of course, this is a, those were the glory days of bipartisanship in some ways, where institution building, establishing institutions that last to this day and are strong to this day. We are in a different era, a dramatically different era. Could somebody like Arthur Vandenberg be elected to the Senate today, or what about make a credible run for the presidency? Well, some of us have heard the same argument about Gerald Ford, where yeah, they could get elected, but they couldn't get nominated. Yeah. And that, that I think, is the, the bigger challenge. But also, you mentioned the, the institutional importance. Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, did not have a great deal of respect for the Congress. I mean, they were thwarting him as he tried to do important things, whether you agree or disagree with it or not, in the New Deal. Um, when Truman came in, he, like Vandenberg, was a child of the Senate, and they had been friends, and you had an institutional respect, and all of a sudden, people like Vandenberg said, here's somebody we can talk to again. He knows how to work with us. In fact, one of the first things that Truman did after he became president when Roosevelt died was to go back and have lunch with a bunch of the Senate leaders. And Roosevelt had kind of given him short shrift, and now here's the new president sitting down with us, and he wants to talk with us. And that flipped everything. And so now you had you, you, Truman as a, as a new president needed the Senate, and the Senate had somebody they could talk to. And so there was immediately a willingness to cross party lines that that, that institutional connection gave them. And you know, once again, we're in a situation where you certainly don't have that kind of institutional tie of any kind. Yeah, right. 
You know, I don't want to neglect the things on the easels that you brought in. We've got three posters oh. back here. Do you want to tell the audience about these images? Oh, sure. Um, the, let's see, well, the two of Vandenberg, I mean, they're fairly, they're only about two years apart. The one is from uh, when Vandenberg is going as an American delegate to the United Nations. And, um, I can't remember what the, what the subtitle is there. And then the other is <clears throat> when he is chairing the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate and so really is, is in charge of making things happen with the Marshall Plan and NATO. And the middle one is from the 1930s at the Ionia Free Fair. And that's just kind of an <laughs> irresistible picture. <laughs> the elephants, that's Looks like good. the elephant's ready to stomp him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hank, you have poured your heart into this book, and you've been in virtually an intellectual marriage with this statesman. What are your hopes for this book? Uh, I, I never wanted to have too many hopes, because I knew this is not a commercial project. I mean, it's really humbling to have everybody come out tonight on something that is, this guy, this guy is not, was not a president. I mean, he was a he was important, but I never had my, I never had any illusions that it would somehow be a bestseller or something. But I, I hope it, the, I hope particularly people in, I'd say in this, I mean, this would be aspirational, that a senator would read it and say, yeah, this is the way we're supposed to behave. And we've kind of lost track of that. appeal to their egos for a little legacy <laughs> building, you know. And I think you, uh, you have your sights maybe on a future project that might be interesting, not something that you want to spend 26 years, 27 years on, but something. I choose very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> but do you have a, a project in mind that you might want to pursue? Um, well, you and I have talked about a couple and I have no idea whether to pursue them or not. And I really, I'm, I'm open to suggestion. So please, you know, if you have some, I'm, I'm, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear them. Well, very good. Hank Meyer, thank you so much for a wonderful conversation, for a wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank you. Thank you all. How fortunate are we in this community to have such brilliant minds, such generous hearts, and then the opportunity to be together for things like this, to learn together and to enjoy together. We thank all of our members and our donors for helping to make evenings like these possible, and we thank everybody for coming tonight. Please join us now in the lobby. Again, we mentioned the book will be for sale. Hank will graciously be signing, and there are refreshments. Let's thank Hank one more time, and thanks again to all of you.